Ossification is the process of how actually we start from hyaline in some cases to reach bone. In both, there are two types of ossification. We'll discuss about the two different types of ossification in endochondral and intramembranous. All of our human bones are, most of them actually, are produced through the endochondral ossification. This is when we first use the cartilage as a, a skeleton, as a structure, as a scaffold to start to produce uh, and to start to make the bone. Uh, the other type is the intramembranous ossification. This is a different type of um, different type of ossification, different type of methodology, in which we have the cells of the mesenchymal origin, which directly will start to form bone. We'll discuss how this process takes place and how exactly it happens. Nonetheless, most of our bodies, most of our bones in the body, are actually produced through the endochondral ossification, which means that first we have the cartilage that in that in time and progressively will actually turn into bone. So first I'll start talking about the intramembranous ossification, then we're going to progress to a bit more complex endochondral ossification. First up, intramembranous ossification. How it takes place is this, that we have the formation of bone through the differentiation of mesenchymal stem cells. This is a typical, for a typical uh, architecture and morphology of a mesenchymal stem cell. Again, this is a progenitor cell. This is a cell that actually has differentiated very, very a little bit from the, the from its uh, embryological origin, and this cell is actually potent and uh, can differentiate into many different types of cells, including adipose, including muscle, including uh, many, many different types of uh, forms and tissues in the human body. In this case, we'll this will actually study how the mesenchymal stem cell will actually congregate along with other mesenchymal stem cells and eventually lead to the formation of bone. So, in the beginning, we have the aggregation of many mesenchymal stem cells, and this aggregation is going to be called nidus. This nidus practically is nothing more than just a group of mesenchymal stem cells that when they come together and when, and when they actually aggregate, they start to produce and to differentiate into osteoprogenitor cells and then directly into the osteoblasts. So, the, the way that this actually works is that um, after these cells aggregate together, they will differentiate again to the osteoblast and eventually start producing osteoid. Imagine these nidus. This nidus is just one location, one small group where they meet. In the product, during the procedure of intramembranification, we're going to have the formation of many different niduses, nidi actually, in one very close to the other. Let's see, for example, in the picture how it actually looks like. So, this in this point here, we can actually see the aggregation of these osteoprogenitor cells, these mesenchymal stem cells, they aggregate. After the aggregation, they're going to start producing, they're going to differentiate into osteoblasts and start producing the osteoid. Of course, the first step, the first step of bone formation is the formation of the immature bone. Eventually, as we said again in the bone class, eventually the immature bone will, will practically mature and transform to the lamellar mature type bone. Let's take another picture actually. We're going to see much better how these nidi look like. One second. Where is this picture? Very good. So, in this picture we can actually see these condensed, this nidus. One nidus is here, second nidus is here. Now, after this formation is taking place, we're going to start seeing the formation of the osteoid. This is, for example, another picture of how it's going to look like. This is actually how uh, the next step after the aggregation of this mesenchymal stem cells. We can see in, this, in the border, in the outer border, of the many different mesenchymal stem cells. In this case, they actually are uh, osteoblasts and they produce these, uh, this osteoid material in the center and the, producing the matrix of the bone. So, during this process, imagine that this formation is going to happen into multiple locations inside the area where the future bone is going to take place. And after these, let's say, groups start to expand and expand and produce more and more osteoid, they will expand further and further more until they actually meet each other. The two different locations, two centers of nidi are going to meet and fuse together to form the actual bone as it is. This is the end result. This is the end result of the fusion of the many different parts of the nidi and uh, leading to this immature bone as it is. Of course, this is a process that requires a lot of minerals, a lot of energy, and of course, all the 
all the highly active procedures and all the highly active tissues in the human body require also always a very very rich nourishment of course that means high amount of oxygen high amount of nutrients and of course most importantly high amount of minerals because without minerals without calcium and without phosphate we cannot form the hydroxyapatite which is the primary mineral of the bone the reason why we see of course eosinophilic colors is because of the high content of the collagen type 1 so this is another picture of how actually this process looks like in another in a more let's say more pinned manner Again, the cells, the mesenchymal stem cells that will eventually transform and differentiate into osteoblasts surround the osteoid and upon expansion we have the fusion of these uh, loci and start to actually form the first, uh, let's say, shape of the bone. So, this is a more histological picture. This is taken, of course, from histology guide. Here we see the first stage of the condensed mesenchymal stem cells and this is the next step where it's actually producing this osteoid now the ideal picture is this why because in this picture we can actually see the high cellular content of the osteoid in the beginning this is the uh, immature bone and as we said before in the bone class the immature bone has high amount of cells and low amount of fibers and here this is the perfect example and this is exactly why uh, this picture in, it actually illustrates the details of how this process uh, actually results in. This is a picture of the mandible, in fact. This, the mandible is kind of, um, let's say, a more special organ for mineralization because in this case, both of these processes, both the, in the, the intramembranous and the endochondral take place. Uh, and the emulsification takes place. So here, this is the first part where we can see the fully, let's say, uh, not the fully, the end result of the fusion of these nidi to form this actual immature bone. And here, this is a typical picture of cartilage. We'll actually go through the endochromal ossification in much more detail. In fact, the endochromal ossification is much more detailed and much more studied than the intramembranous ossification. So, to sum up, the intramembranous ossification is a unique form that is a unique form of ossification that mostly takes place in the skull and the skull is primarily formed by the intramembranous ossification. Again, this, is the, this, this process initiates, is initiated by the uh, aggregation of many mesenchymal stem cells, which will eventually differentiate into osteoprogenitor cells and then directly to osteoblasts. These osteoblasts are going to form, start to form and produce osteoid in this, uh, in this locus and the many different nidi after the continuous deposition of the osteoid will enlarge, 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 expand until they meet each other, fuse and form while we have the immature woven bone. So, let's go into endochondral ossification, a much more complex procedure, but we know way more things about it. It's way more studied process. In fact, the term endochondral actually comes from the word endo, which means inside, and chondral, which means cartilage. This is actually, this describes perfectly uh, the whole process of how we start from cartilage and we end up to the bone. So, in the beginning, there are actually, there are many, many different phases as you can see. There are many steps along the way that we actually uh, see and discuss. We'll discuss them each and one by one, uh, detailedly, step by step. So... The first process, the first, uh, the, the origin, of course, is when we have the hyaline cartilage. This is our scaffold. This is our structure on which and in which we're going to use the scaffold to produce the bone. So, the first step is we have this hyaline cartilage as it is. The second step is when we start to have the formation of this bony collar. What does it actually mean? What does it mean, this bony collar? Bony collar is nothing more than an aggregation of minerals in the perichondrium. In fact, we discussed the structure of the cartilage in the, peri in the perichondrium, in the cartilage and the periosteum in the bone. But actually, these two structures are highly similar because in both cases, in both the perichondrium and the periosteum, we have two layers. The two layers are exactly identical, meaning what? The outer layer is the fibrous layer that contains collagen type 1 along with fibroblasts. And then we have the second layer the inner layer. The inner layer is also called, in the case of the um, 
in the case of the perichondrium, we have, it's called the stratum chondrogenicum, and in the case of the bone, it's stratum osteogenicum. Nonetheless, both of these uh, names, both of these layers are, can actually be called the cellular layer. Why? Because here we meet the mesenchymal stem cells, either in both cases, and in the case of the uh, osteum, in the, in the periosteum, we find that with these cells will differentiate into the osteoprogenitor cells, whereas in the cartilage, we're going to be formed the we're going to have the chondroblast or the progenitor cells of the chondroblast. Both of them are exactly the same. They're mesenchymal stem cells. They're the first evolution of the mesenchymal stem cells. So in this perichondrium, it's still, because still there's cartilage, it's not bone yet. This condensation of minerals around this perichondrium and in the periphery of the cartilage actually is the uh, what is going to form the bony color, just nothing more than aggregation and mineralization, extra mineralization of the, uh, let's say, of the periphery, in the central periphery of the cartilage. The next step is this. The result of this condensed minerals in the periphery results into one difficulty. Whenever we have, of course, as we remember from the practical of the cartilage, cartilage is not very thick, it has a specific thickness, and this is because the cartilage is avascular, meaning what? meaning that there are no vessels that penetrate the center or uh, within the actual tissue of the cartilage. This means that whenever we have low amount of, um, low amount of, um, come on, sorry, low amount of vessels, low amount of vascular supply, there is a limited thickness. Why? Because the, all the vascular tissues, that is the epithelium, that is the cartilage, and all of these tissues that are vascular receive nourishment through diffusion. So imagine that in the center of this cartilage, now there is higher difficulty of diffusion. Why? Because you have a higher amount of minerals on the sides. And because of the high amount, high amount of minerals on the sides, there is a higher difficulty of diffusion from the vessel that imagine is somewhere in the periphery to the center. So in other words, the center of the cartilage is poorly vascularized. As a consequence, these cells that are in the center do two things. Hypertrophy as a result, as a reaction to the poor vascular supply. And the second reaction is the production of vascular growth factors. This is general principle of the body in all the cells, in all the tissues. Whenever a tissue or a cell is poorly vascularized, this cell is going to try its best to start receiving again this nourishment, meaning it's going to start to induce the production of vessels. And this, is, this happens through the vascular growth factors. So again, the chondrocytes that are within the center of the cartilage, and of course the chondroblasts as well, will hypertrophy, grow in size, and start to produce these vascular growth factors. Of course, because there's not going to be in the beginning the penetration of the vessels, the penetration of the vascular supply, this is going to lead result to its death. So imagine that in the center we're going to start having hollow spaces, empty spaces full of minerals and ECM that actually are produced by these chondrocytes and chondroblasts, that will actually lead to empty spaces. So this space, the center is going to be empty spaces filled with minerals, with ECM, which contains of course the glycoproteins, the amorphous glycol substance and fibers. The fibers, of course, are going to be collagen and some, some parts of elastic cartilage, elastic fibers, sorry. And in the amorphous ground substance, we're going to have the multi attested glycoproteins, the glycosaminoglycans, and the uh, protoglycans. These are the, these molecules, these uh, fibers, and these substances are and actually constitute the ideal field for the next cells to, we'll see which cells actually go into this place, but it's, it's an ideal field for the future cells to come and actually uh, and inhabit this empty space. So, because of the high amount of the vascular growth factors, we're going to start to have the penetration of vessels. The vessels are going to practically penetrate the periosteum and the bony collar and actually start to form the first ossification center within the center of the cartilage. This means this actually results the moment you have the penetration of the vas of the vesicle of the vessels, sorry, to the center, the cartilage no longer exists. 
the term of the thermopedic chondrium no longer stands. Why? Because the moment we have the vessel in the center, it's now it's now called a periosteum. This is a start like at the beginning phase of the bone itself. So after we have this penetration of these of the vessels, we're gonna have the formation of the primary ossification center. And this is where the actual the first form of bone marrow is going to start to form within the center. So we're going to have these hemo, hemopoietic stem cells coming from the vessels to the center of the cartilage. And here this is the perfect picture to actually show and illustrate exactly how this is going to look like. We're going to have the scaffolds, the practically the matrix, the remnant matrix of the calcified cartilage in the center, which is going to be penetrated by this vascular supply. The vascular supply, this practically vessels, will bring within the bone marrow, within the, uh, the cavity, within the cartilage cavity, bone cavity in fact, these hematopoietic stem cells, which will eventually differentiate to form the bone marrow. So this is the first step of uh, the bone, after the bone formation. The next step is the penetration of the diaphysis. The diaphysis in this, sorry, the epiphysis, I'm sorry, the epiphysis. The top and bottom are called the epiphysis. So in this case, the penetration of the vessels from the outer part of the periosteum towards the center of the epiphysis is going to be the first step for the formation of the, uh, of the secondary ossification center. So... Uh, one, thing, one uh, thing that I forgot to mention is that the periosteal bone, the sides, this bony collar is actually formed through the intramembranous ossification. Meaning what? Meaning that in the sides, on the sides, we're going to actually have the mesenchymal stem cells forming together, coming together. And of course, these mesenchymal stem cells are found within the periosteum. So the cellular layer, these, in the cellular layer, we're going to have the condensation of these mesenchymal stem cells and the production of osteoid, as we saw in the beginning, with the intramembranous ossification. So the pony color is formed in this manner. And again, the next stage is the uh, formation of the ossification center, the primary ossification center in the center, where we have the apoptotic, the necrotic and dead uh, spaces, uh, the dead chondrocytes and chondroblasts that leave the perfect field for these vessels to come in. And the second stage is the formation of the secondary ossification center right here. So this is basically the process of how we establish these ossification centers. We'll discuss the process of the formation of the bone after we discuss this uh, practically penetration of the vessels and how these cells, how the uh, actually the, this X cartilage now has the capacity to allow for osteoblasts to form the bone. So we have the formation of the secondary specification center both on the top and on the lower border of the bone. So. After this penetration, after this penetration of the vessels, we're going to have the in, in, enough and adequate vascular supply to, to provide the, uh, both the cartilage and the osteoblast the capacity to produce the bone as it is. So, since now that we've covered the whole stages, of the whole stages of the formation of the uh, ossification centers from the beginning, which is the hyaline cartilage, to the very end, which is the pure mature bone. The whole magic, the whole trick of forming the bone is found in the epiphyseal plates. We'll discuss them in detail. So, how will this happen? How do we have the formation of bone, the elongation of bone and the thickening of the bone from a very, very thin and, let's admit it, much, much weaker cartilage in comparison to the bone, of course. So, this happens through the epiphyseal plate. Understanding the epiphyseal plate and how the epiphyseal plate actually works is the number one step to understanding ossification.